Uh, I have not. I have not written out the talk because I hope to be able to revise what I say uh, in conversation with my co-panelists today uh, in order to create something that uh, is more than the sum of its parts for the publication that we're planning for afterwards. So I'll be speaking relatively freely uh, on the topics indicated here. Just to give you a very brief overview, uh, I think in Christianity, eschatology is a very multifaceted um, set of doctrines or concepts, which has influenced through the cultural dominance of Christianity, the entire conception of history in the West um, from the earliest days until today in various forms. And so I think it's very important when we look at Christianity's concept of eschatology to take into account all those different dimensions, the textual dimension, uh, the source texts from which Christianity takes its doctrine and its concepts, the historical dimension, in other words, the way in which the concept of eschatology has developed uh, over the centuries has influenced domains other than religion and theology, from politics to philosophy to science, how it has been influenced by those other domains and brought back into the Christian faith and Christian conceptions. We need to look at ways in which the very deeply embedded ideas of Christian eschatology as a frame for our whole conception, both of individual human life and of history as a whole, have been transformed uh, in a time period in modernity when belief in God was no longer taken for granted. And therefore, uh, the foundations of these beliefs in Revelation were no longer taken for granted. And in which, nevertheless, the ideas uh, about history and about life that came to, uh, that came about through these religious texts and beliefs uh, have continued to be transformed and to shape uh, secular thought uh, and secular politics. And then we also very centrally have to, um, have to think about the way in which eschatology is part of all other Christian doctrines. In other words, we call eschatology a distributed doctrine. It's not only a self-contained set of concepts, it also interacts with the ways in which Christianity understands creation, protology. We started talking about that yesterday. Uh, in the way uh, it interacts with the way in which Christianity understands salvation, which is, of course, one of the key loci uh, of Christian belief, and in which Christianity understands morality, fulfillment, joy, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then finally, uh, as I say, we should consider um, the way in which eschatological ideas, in other words, in this particularly ideas about the end of the world now, interact with pressure points in history because there is a very strange tension, I think more so in Christianity than perhaps the other religions, although this might be a commonality between them. Um, there's a very strong sense in which eschatology and the belief that we are living somehow in the end times um, is a way to understand one's own period as unique and as uniquely significant. And Christians have been reaching for this sense of a uniquely significant time in which they might be living just before the return of the Messiah again and again in history. So we have a strange tension between a sort of um, exceptionalism and the recurrent patterns that this exceptionalism takes in history. So I'd like to briefly at least uh, touch on all of these topics. That's a lot to cover in half an hour. Uh, and I will say more about some things than about others, but we can take anything up in discussion afterwards. Uh, I'm very grateful to Professor Elledge for already having laid out so clearly and so well the uh, Hebrew Bible and um, pseudepigraphal texts that also inform Christian eschatology. Um, these were taken very seriously and studied very seriously really throughout Christian history as important source texts for Christian understandings of the uh, coming world, of the end of the world, of the messianic kingdom of resurrection, but they were decisively transformed in the Christian imagination by the New Testament, of course. The central transformation that occurred was the coming of Jesus who was accepted by those who followed him, both among Jews at the time and predominantly among Gentiles at the time, as the Messiah who was foretold by the Old Testament prophecies. 
And therefore, many of the eschatological texts and prophecies, both uh, of the what came to be called the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, and of the texts surrounding it, uh, came to be seen as fulfilled in the now. Um, Jesus was seen as fulfilling uh, exceptionally well some of the promises of a Prince of Peace uh, who would come and so forth, but there nevertheless remained messianic prophecies and eschatological prophecies that were clearly not fulfilled in any obvious way by Jesus as he came. Um, and this was reinforced by Jesus's own words as recorded in the New Testament, that the end had not yet fully come, that he was ushering in the kingdom, but that the, uh, that the disciples should expect a return, an imminent return of the Messiah in which in the return, uh, the prophecies of a glorious restoration, rather than just of um, perhaps inner peace and so forth, would be fulfilled. So in the New Testament, we see a persistent tension between an, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of arrival, uh, a sense of the opening of uh, Israel to all nations, which was of course a key part uh, of some biblical prophecies about the Messianic kingdom, about the eschaton, so we see a tension between that sense of fulfillment on the one hand uh, and the sense of expectation of living at the time after Jesus's resurrection and ascension of living in a time of waiting for the imminent return uh, of Christ, of the Messiah to, uh, to fulfill the remaining eschatological prophecies. And it's interesting to see in the New Testament texts a variety of conceptions of what that final fulfillment would look like. Uh, there was certainly a consensus, a, a majority consensus on an expectation of resurrection. When Christ would come back, all the dead would rise. Everyone would be judged uh, and the righteous or the saved would join Christ in a messianic kingdom. There was also, however, a minority report, so to say, um, exemplified by passages such as the parable of Lazarus and the rich man, or Jesus is saying to the thief um, on the cross, you shall be with me in paradise today. A minority report of voices that seemed to suggest that the coming kingdom or the eschatological kingdom, the final fulfillment, at least of the individual was to be found not in a future to be expected here on earth, a coming of the new Jerusalem, a return of the Messiah, but rather in a fulfillment in a sort of parallel world, a parallel reality in which God already dwelled and in which we would come to dwell with him. And that became an extremely important minority report for later developments, particularly when Christianity became um, much more closely associated with Platonism and Neoplatonism and the idea of an immortal soul rather than a resurrected body became a much more intuitive and attractive way of imagining um, ultimate fulfillment and the ultimate things. Another um, very important thing that we see there in the New Testament is not only this tension of voices already between a world to come and a parallel spiritual world, but also a developing sense over the course of the decades in which the New Testament was written from a very early expectation exemplified, for example, in 1 Corinthians, um, which is probably Paul's earliest epistle written about 45 CE, uh, a very imminent expectation of the return, uh, expressing itself in moral exhortations not to marry, not to seek once uh, a change of one's state because everything was extremely temporary and we were just waiting for Jesus to come back to an expectation later in the canon um, that actually we might be in for the long haul. And so we see in the later New Testament texts developments of um, ethical systems or moral injunctions that seem to be settling in for a longer wait. So that's the New Testament foundations. Uh, they remained decisive for the rest of Christianity and were supplemented by some later apocalyptic texts um, and the most important of those probably is a medieval thinker called Joachim of Fiora, who became um, very influential both on theological thought and on political thought. 
Uh, Joachim of Fiora took very seriously the Christian doctrine of a trinity uh, of God as three persons in one, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. And he divided world history into three eras under the rule of each of the three persons. So Joachim saw the time of the Old Testament of the Israelites as the time of God the Father, that corresponded with only, only the Father having been revealed, having revealed himself, so to say. The time of the church, which began um, with the coming of Christ and was continuing into his own day as the age of the sun, over which uh, the sun reigned. And most crucially for him, a coming age, uh, which would be the age of the spirit and which would be the fulfillment of all those prophecies about uh, no longer needing a law written on stone because the law would be written in our hearts, um, everyone prophesying, everyone dreaming, everybody being uh, in a state of fulfillment. Uh, this became a blueprint really for a conception of history that continued through Hegel, uh, that continued through a number of, uh, of modern thinkers, was also influential already in the Re Reformation. So this sort of architecture of world history as the age of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. We, um, we see in those texts um, a number of tensions that continue to shape theological thought about the eschaton. But I'll leave that aside for just the moment to talk about the things that most Christians agree on when they talk about eschatology. And if we have time at the end, we'll come back to some of the tensions and how they work out in, um, in various domains. So as I've said before, um, eschatology is what we call a distributed doctrine. Eschatology in Christianity concerns the last things. Uh, it concerns questions, both individual and historical, about the ultimate ends of life and of history. And it's important to remember that in Christianity, it always, um, just like salvation, eschatology always has this dual track of concerning both the individual and uh, history at large. And particularly on the side of the individual, when we think about the last things, um, we think about four things. This is the traditional division of eschatology um, within Christian doctrine. The four last things, death, judgment, heaven, and hell. Uh, this is how the doctrine was formally divided, as I say, in the Middle Ages. And those four loci um, were the focus of systematic treatments for a long time until relatively recently. Um, so eschatology concerns the question of death. Uh, and a large question here, and this reaches back to protology, a large question here for Christians is whether death is a natural part of the created order or whether death is an imposition as a result uh, of the fall into sin that Christianity uh, identifies the third chapter of Genesis as describing. Certainly, however, whether it is a natural part of, or a part of the natural order, or an imposed punishment for sin, Christian eschatology holds on to the belief that death will be overcome. Uh, and this is one of the key messages, of course, of um, the work of Jesus Christ, that he came, died, and rose again, in order to overcome death. There are various ways of conceiving what it means for him to overcome death. Um, and those have to do with a, 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 a basic decision, whether eschatology has more to do with creation or more to do with salvation. Um, and I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. So death uh, is a key locus of eschatology. Judgment, as I say, is a key locus. This is taken directly from uh, the sacred texts. There are many passages um, in the Hebrew Bible, but particularly in the New Testament that describe a last judgment. And it is extremely important to the Christian conception of the world that there be a final judgment in which everything everyone ever has done is revealed, uh, is exposed to, where the truth is exposed, um, where deeds are weighed up. And even though, uh, in Christianity, it's equally important that it is not ultimately our deeds that decide our final fate, yet nevertheless, this moment of truth 
uh, is, is really baked into Christian ethics and Christian morality as a whole. I say that the final truth about our deeds is not what decides our final end, and that's of course because in Christianity uh, it's faith in Christ ultimately which um, um, which opens the way into salvation, or it's Christ's work. Um, there's debate, of course, about whether faith in it is required or not, but for most of Christian history, it was taken for granted that faith in Christ's work is required. It is by participating in Christ, it's by um, being taken up into his death and resurrection uh, that we come to, to eternal life. And the last two loci, uh, heaven and hell, uh, then describe the two uh, traditional destinations um, with a lot of discussion about particularly the nature of hell because, of course, um, Christianity being a, a universal religion in the sense that it sees uh, God's purpose not just for Israel, but for opening up to the entire world, is in tendency universalist. Uh, it is in tendency a religion that envisions the salvation the being taken up of all people, uh, and yet it also has an exclusionist element in, uh, in the question of faith in Jesus Christ. So there, there has always been debate in Christianity about the question whether hell is an imposed punishment by God, which can be quite difficult to reconcile with uh, a description of his character as all loving, whether hell is simply the pain of a self exile from the presence of God, um, whether hell is eternal, uh, whether it's temporary and so forth. So those are, those are the four loci under which eschatology has generally been treated. As I say, the really, the really intriguing bit about eschatology as a, a puzzle piece of Christian theology is its relationship on the one hand to salvation and on the other hand to creation. And here we have two very interestingly divergent views which can be associated with the Christian East and the Christian West um, respectively. In the Christian West, and particularly in the Protestant tradition, um, there is a general sense of the shape of the world, and the, or the shape of history, and particularly the shape of salvation history, as having a sort of V-shape. Um, the idea is that we began in a state of perfection uh, in the Garden of Eden. We fell through the sin of Adam to a point of either partial or complete depravity. And Jesus' is coming, his death and resurrection, um, opened the way to reattain, to restore the perfection which we lost at the beginning. Uh, and in a sense, heaven then, or the eternal life, is the reward for this restored life or the fulfillment of this restored life um, beyond death or after death and resurrection. Uh, this is partly rationalized not so much by the clarity of the biblical text about the fall into sin, um, as we know from the fact that Genesis 3 is not recognized as quite the same cataclysmic fall in Judaism. It's not, uh, it's not uh, obviously readable from the text, but in Christianity, this, uh, this cataclysmic fall is inferred from the enormity of the sacrifice that they imagine that we imagine Christ is having made. So the enormity of the fact of God Himself becoming a human being, being put to death, um, must mean that if such an enormous act on the part of God was necessary, there must be an equally enormous um, fall to atone for. So this is the, the the Western view, the dominant Western view, at least from uh, the Reformation onwards. The Eastern view, and in this case, therefore, eschatology is primarily associated with the doctrine of salvation. So eschatology, the end, um, correlates with our acceptance, uh, our, uh, our, our taking on uh, of the restorative work of Christ, and it's in some sense a fulfillment of that. In the Eastern view, eschatology is much more closely associated with the doctrine of creation, uh, and here we have a view of history that doesn't resemble a V mark so much as a sort of check mark. So here we have a view of Adam and Eve not as having been perfect, and we find this view first in Irenaeus, but then taken up particularly in the East, uh, not so much as having been perfect, but as having been as yet incomplete. 
uh, Adam and Eve were, were almost like children. Creation was not yet um, in, its, in, in anything like its mature state. And their fall into sin was bad, but it was also to some extent understandable because for this Eastern view, the purpose of creation from the beginning and particularly the creation of human beings was always to be taken up and to participate in the life of God. Because for Christianity, God is not a single person, but rather a unity of a triunity of three persons who exist in perpetual and eternal relationship to each other. There's a very natural conception of creation, therefore, as the outflowing of that intra-Trinitarian love for the purpose of drawing creation and particularly uh, rational creation human beings back into uh, or up into that, uh, that relationship and that love that has characterized God from the beginning. So here for the Eastern view, creation and Adam and Eve uh, human beings were always destined, were always called to be taken up into the divine life. But of course, they cannot and could not do so by their own strength. Uh, the very point of being taken up into a relationship is that you can't achieve it on your own. Uh, it has to be done for you or with you. And their fall into sin for this, uh, for this Eastern tradition was in the sense um, possible because what the snake tempted them to do, namely to become like gods, was indeed their eternal vocation. It was just um, pursued in the wrong way, namely by a pursuit of autonomy, of perfect knowledge and so forth, rather than um, by the pursuit of a continuing relationship with God. So the fall into sin is not as cataclysmic and the coming of Christ and the work of Christ is primarily a fulfillment or a finishing or a beginning of the finishing of creation rather than a restoration, because here in Christ, we have the God man who is able, who brings together the human and the divine, who overcomes death, which on this account is a natural part of the created order at the beginning, and who is therefore able to allow people to bring humans into participation with him uh, and to reach their appointed, their appointed uh, vocation, their appointed end. So here eschatology is really uh, the fulfillment of the purposes of creation as they were set from the beginning. That is also to some extent the case in the Protestant view, but not, not nearly as clearly. Um, so there we have it. Uh, that's, the, that's the key doctrinal locus or um, versions of doctrinal locus of eschatology within Christianity. And you can see already uh, that it is a, a very integral and important part of how Christians conceive the overall structure of their religion and belief. It, it really changes how you see eschatology and how it fits with everything else, really colors and changes how you perceive uh, the moral injunctions of Christianity, uh, the historical claims of Christianity and so forth. Okay, that's the two largest parts. Um, I have only three minutes left. So let me just say uh, one very brief thing about historical manifestations and then uh, a just slightly less brief thing about cultural conversations. Uh, as I said before, there is, uh, there is a persistent question that Christians find themselves faced with, which is where in history do they stand? There's a clear sense uh, in Christianity, not only of a waiting for fulfillment, as there is in Judaism, but of a being caught between the times. Um, there's, a, there's a duality of sense of already having found the fulfillment of the desire of the nations, uh, already believing in the Messiah who has come, and the age of the church already being to some extent uh, a messianic kingdom because it tries to live out the injunctions of, uh, of Christ on earth uh, and to live in faithfulness to him. And on the other hand, there's a persistent sense of not yet, um, of Christ not yet having come back. And there are uh, fierce debates all through Christian history about why it is that the seemingly imminent promises of the New Testament of an imminent return have after 2000 years still not taken place. And as you can imagine, um, there are many, many responses and, and interpretations of that. 
But one very interesting thing is that this means that there is to Christians, in a sense, a resource um, for interpreting particularly difficult times, which has been reached for again and again. So when there are times of global crisis, and I take this to mean crisis in at least three dimensions, uh, natural crisis, so the occurrence of, uh, of, of, of natural shifts or cataclysms in our age, certainly that includes um, global warming, but it also included things like, you know, the earthquake of Lisbon, um, cataclysmic events like that. Political crisis, um, so shifts in political order or crises of established political structures, uh, economic uh, crisis, and then most importantly, intellectual crisis. So at times of, uh, of natural, political, economic, and, nat uh, and intellectual crisis, people have been very quick to reach for a historical explanation of this confluence of crises by saying, we must be living in the last age. We must be living in the time of the birth pangs before the coming of the Messiah. And so at key moments in history, we have both communal and individual responses that assume that nothing can explain a crisis of this magnitude other than that we are in the last days. Uh, and I think that is actually quite relevant to our current situation, um, where especially in political religions, messianic rhetoric uh, and rhetoric of cataclysm and of uh, utopia are very prevalent and very powerfully attractive to, to people who find themselves uh, in the midst of these many different kinds of crises. All right, I've said more about that than I expected. Uh, so just very briefly, um, with regard to other cultural domains and other intellectual domains, uh, eschatology interacts in interesting and often conflictual ways, particularly with science uh, and with technology, as well as, of course, with politics. Um, we have um, we have big questions faced now, of course, about um, with regard to science, um, cosmological theories about the running down of the cosmos, about entropy and so forth. How do those relate to Christian eschatological expectations? Um, how does Darwinism and a sort of global denial of teleology in the cosmos relate to the very teleological Christian view um, of the created order. In technology, we have very interesting interactions with eschatology because many things that used to be purely spiritual promises associated with religion, promises of eternal life, of a cheating of death, uh, of a superhuman capability, which used to be, as I say, associated with the eschatological or resurrected order, are suddenly coming into the practical purview of human beings as they are on earth. Uh, the annihilation of the world um, is, a, is a real possibility. The creation of a singularity of transhumanist goals um, of super AI and so forth are real possibilities. And so there are really interesting questions uh, on, the, um, on the interface between uh, religion and technology in those domains and what it means, you know, to, to what extent these eschatological desires for immortality and perfection are um, rooted in human beings quite apart from religion, to what extent these are distinctly religious impulses and make technology itself into a kind of religion and so forth. Those are some of the most interesting questions being debated uh, in, in or at the uh, in the sort of ambit of eschatology at the moment. And there I think uh, I will stop other than to say that of course politics uh, is an obvious field of contention as well, but we've already touched on that and, uh, and to open for questions. Thank you.